We made this. Hello and welcome to another edition of the podcast I call Pick a Disc. I'm your host, Matt Latham, and this is the podcast where people pick a disc to talk about for whatever reason they want to. And today, the disc picker is Mike Slamer, who is going to be picking the Gaslight Anthems handwritten. And as usual, we'll talk about everything to do with the album, the songs, etc, etc, etc. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting conversation. So um, you'll be listening to that in a second. And before we do that, I just want to point out that you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc, etc, etc. It's the usual spiel, you know. And if you're listening to this but you don't follow us, we are pretty much on every podcast app of choice. And if I'm not on one, let me know and I'll see if I can get my get pick a disc on there. And yeah, I think that is pretty much all the things you have to cover for in the opening section of the podcast. So, um, but yeah, before we continue, don't forget that the... Um, podcast has a discord that you can join and you know just tell us what you've been listening to and also uh we made this as a patreon that you can subscribe to and you get like a a sneak peek of a bunch of stuff um to do with the network so yeah so um that's it i think that's pretty much everything on my to-do list mentioned it is yes everything on my to-do list is mentioned and the only thing that's left to do is hit play where i speak to mike what breed? What breed is? Are they? He he's a uh, he's a he's a husky shepherd mix. Uh, oh, okay. He he's just made his way out of the uh, of the space here. I actually gave him gave him some treats and some toys to fuss around with, so they're not like under my feet the whole time. <laughs> um, they've calmed down a little bit, but every time I come down here, they're like, "Oh, cool! It's playtime! It's playtime! Let's let's go hog wild!" Because uh, on, only this room got finished and the rest of the basement is still like unfinished. So they treat it like they're, they're den and they, they fuck <laughs> around. Uh, but the other one here, he is, there he is. <clears throat> there he is. He's laying there in the corner. Hey bud. Hey bud. Yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a Russian, he's a Russian Sulamov where if you were to, if you were to look it up, Online, if you just type in Sulamov dog, you'll get mm-hmm. taken to a uh, a pretty cool YouTube page from National Geographic, where they did a whole thing on uh on how he was bred and why he was bred. Uh, long story short, airport security. He he's an airport security duck, oh, um, yeah. and uh uh he found his way to the U.S. through his previous owner, who sadly passed away. Uh, and the dog wound up at a rescue agency because his remaining family was allergic to the dog and, and they couldn't take him. So, uh, uh, I, I, every, about every couple of months I'll, I'll send the family like pictures and updates and like, Hey, brief is doing really well. You don't have to worry. You know, he's, he's living his best life. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I like to joke around with people that he's a retired Russian security dog <laughs> and, um, if if anyone happens to know any Russian, they could speak it to him, and he'll perk right up. He'll <laughs> he'll go. I I talk to him sometimes in like you know limited Russian. You know, I'll say uh, "moradits," which generally translates to "good boy, you did a good job." You know, uh, so I'll say that to him, and and all his basic commands are in Russian. I don't want to go and make it pick a dog, which. Thinking about it, it might be a decent podcast title, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> pick a dog. Pick a yes, dog. yes. But um, Mike is here to pick a disc and talk about an album that you've that you've chosen to talk about today. And why don't you tell the listeners the disc that you've picked? Yeah, so I have chosen the album "Handwritten" by the Gaslight Anthem, uh, released in 2012. And yeah. I think for the purpose of this conversation. Um, I'll be referencing the deluxe edition, which uh, had some bonus tracks that released on streaming services. Released nine years ago today, uh, air quote today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, on the day of this podcast release, um, it's it was nine years old to the day. It was released on the 20th of July, 2012. So um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be interested to ask you about a couple of the deluxe, about a couple of the deluxe tracks. I've not actually listened to the deluxe tracks in mm. the... 
So I've just been listening to just the original version of the album. Sure. So in the in the ba- in the lead up to stuff, but um, yeah. So the Gaslight Anthem. Um, so before we talk about them and the album in general, why have you picked and written? Mm, good, good question. So the Gaslight Anthem. Uh, I did not grow up with them. Uh, they they were getting big about the time um right around 2012 2010 uh so they're a relatively relatively recent rock band and i picked them because when i listen to the gaslight anthem i feel as though i feel as though i can see myself in the songs every song that gets written um, by any artist, you know, the, a songwriter is thinking about a character, you know, whether it's themselves or a friend or they're making up a story, right? But there's always an antagonist or a protagonist in a song. And sometimes they're very personal and sometimes they are the exact opposite. But when I listen to realistically any album from the Gaslight Anthem, uh, the early stuff up to the, the latest release, Get Hurt, um, I can kind of, hear and feel myself in the shoes of the character that they're talking about in a song. And so it speaks to me on that level. And I've always gravitated to songwriters who can tell a story in that kind of a way that can layer different meaning in, in a verse, who can layer different meanings with music and separating that out from the song itself just being a song for the sake of being a song. How many musicians are out there right now? Pop stars, you know, they write, they write, they write, they write. And it goes on the radio and you listen and you're like, that's a cool beat. And you never hear it again, right? There's tons of that. And that's not to take anything away. That's not to say that one method is better than the other. It's simply to say that when you listen to music, you can be a passive listener or you can be an active listener. And I think for most of the listening public, they may be a little bit more passive about how they listen. But with the Gaslight Anthem, and that goes for me too, that goes for me too. I I can be a very passive listener uh, where I'm not necessarily engaged with the lyrics or I'm not engaged with the guitar work or the rhythm or what the bass guitar is doing. But with Gaslight... I am fully engaged. I am listening to not just the lyric, but I'm listening to that little shimmering guitar that's drenched in reverb in the background. I'm also listening to that snare and how the bottom ring of that snare just dissipates on the recording. Like that stuff just, it grabs me. It just, it gets me, it gets a hold of me and it's like in my, in my chest, it's in my skin. I get goosebumps listening to it. And when the lyrics come in, those vocals, you know, there's, there's a lot of great, uh, and we'll get into it, but there's a lot of great lines that I immediately say, Ooh, I, I can feel, I feel that right now. If I listened to it five years ago, I may have felt one way. If I listen to it today, it may say something different to me. And, uh, today, um, I was driving, I was actually listening to the album, obviously in preparation for, for this right here to chat with you. I, 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 I kept hearing things. And I was like, you know, that is that is why I love music because you come back to it at a certain point in your life. Maybe your headspace is different. Maybe you have gone through something traumatic in your life and a song suddenly jumps at you and it grabs you and it says, this is what we're talking about. What you're feeling right now, that's what this is about. That's what this song is. And so I chose this album in part because I think it's their strongest release in my opinion. Uh, and I really feel that each of the songs have something to say. So, you know, listeners out there, if you pick up this album, one song may not connect with you, but another one might. And I firmly believe that there is something in this album for everybody. Great, great reason for picking the, picking the album. But how did you discover or learn of the Gaslight Anthem? Mm. Was, and was this the first album theirs you heard? Handwritten is not the first album I've heard. I've always been tangentially aware of the Gaslight Anthem. Um, so a little bit about me. I live in the great state of New Jersey, which is mm-hmm. where the Gaslight Anthem is from. And here in New Jersey, we have our own music scene. Uh, you've probably heard of the Misfits. You've probably heard of the Bouncing Souls. You've definitely heard of Bruce Springsteen, right? Who? <laughs> <laughs> sorry carl um, <laughs> sorry carl if you're listening 
<laughs> yes, um, Bruce Springsteen, who we've covered on the po- on the podcast in oh, the past. Yeah. We, oh, yeah. um, I think ten, I think st- I think actually that is the oldest album we've covered on the podcast. Actually, oh. yeah, there's seventy six uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town um, we covered. So yeah, sorry, Which, sorry, sorry, carry on. Sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's a great that's a great point because. Uh, some of the music, the earlier stuff that Gaslight Anthem put out, um, I would highly recommend looking up the album American Slang, where some critics actually pointed out, they're like, there is a little bit of darkness on the edge of town in this album. And it's all connected. It really is. Uh, Brian Fallon, uh, the front man for Gaslight Anthem, he has shared the stage with Bruce Springsteen. Not only did they open for him one time, but they actually got up and played a song together. Uh, and a lot of local critics here in New Jersey are kind of like, oh yeah, you guys are the next coming of Bruce Springsteen. It's very, you know, down to earth, working class type music. Um, the songs really speak to, to, to growing up to that small town, that heartland vibe. And that is very meaningful. Everything has a purpose to it. Every, every lyric that gets written, it makes you feel like you want to connect with the person who's writing it. And I know that, uh, the band itself had a hard time shaking some of that, some of that review because, I don't know about you, but it's, it's weird being pushed into the shadow of someone else and constantly being compared and, 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 uh, related to in that way. So as, as a musician, I'm not sure that I would want someone to tell me, Oh yeah, you know, you remind me of Bruce Springsteen. I'm like, well, I want to be Mike. I don't want to be Bruce. So while I appreciate that compliment, it's a great one. Like, I still want you to, to recognize me. And I know that is something that the band, uh, had struggled with throughout their, throughout their tenure. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. So based in New Jersey, um, and come to think of it, I, I was, I, while you're speaking, I was kind of looking back at the, my spreadsheet. Um, and I think this is, this possibly is actually the fifth artist from New Jersey we've covered. Oh. Um, yeah. So for example, the first one, um, was all the way back in March 2019 on the sixth ever episode, a band called Brick and Mortar um, mm. from uh, Tom's River in uh, New Jersey. Uh, then we had uh, Mr. Springsteen, which is from Long Branch. Uh, then we had, we had, who else do we have? I'm lost. We've got, oh yes, um, a singer songwriter by the name of Paul Simon. Oh. Uh, yeah, who was from Newark. Yes, uh, he was. And, and very recently, actually, um, very recently, only a few episodes ago, in an episode that hasn't aired yet, uh, My Chemical Romance we covered just about two or three episodes ago. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. In that so, vein, you also have Thursday as well. A band I've never listened to, but I've got friends who talk about them mm. quite a lot. But yeah, so it makes a change from a band being from New York. Um, it must be states with the states that has the word new in it because there's quite <laughs> a lot of New York bands we covered on there as well. But um, so yeah, there's quite a strong legacy of like band, bands and stuff and like being, being compared to others. But I think that might be because, um, New Jersey feels like it's got a very strong musical identity of its own. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that perhaps it's got a kind of like, is it right to say kind of like Heartland rock? Like could, could the term yeah. Heartland rock. Um, yeah. I, I, did it, uh, whether it originated in New Jersey or at least it's, or it's kind mm. of like very heavily focused because of Bruce Springsteen. I think because I think perhaps Bruce Springsteen is quite the high profile or one of the most high profile aspects of that kind of genre and sound. I think everyone gets lumped into that. It's kind of probably like if you go think about California, um, and if and you and people are going, oh, you sound like the Beach Boys, yeah, and yeah, Beach Boys and stuff. But that's kind of like the Californian surfer rock sound that sure. they categorized. But it was kind of like their sound. Sure. Speech. Again, again, and again, if you want to go over California again, um, people, people saying, oh, you sound just like NWA because, but then again, that gangster rap star was mm-hmm. originated in, in that. So I can kind of see, I can see why probably people would go to that extreme and start comparing like a lot of like kind of like bands that sound like the Gaslight Anthem to Bruce Springsteen. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, I can kind of see the point as well where I think, yeah, we, what we want to be gas, I want to be Brian Fallon. I don't want to be. Right, Springsteen. Yeah, um, right. I, I just, I, I want to be, be 
Brian Fallon playing kind of the New Jersey sound. It's yeah. just that it's just that Bruce Springsteen did it as well. <laughs> he did break off and uh, you know start doing some solo work, which you know I, I he is a prolific songwriter, and I know he's gone through like everyone has gone through their stuff collectively, right? Uh, without putting a word to it. But the way that he can craft all that feeling, that energy, and put it into a song, you know, that is the heart of Americana. That is the heart of Heartland Rock. You know, that is what people strive for when they are writing this kind of music. I'm convinced that at some point I would have listened to the Gaslight Anthem, but I don't think I was an active listener. Mm -hmm. Not in the active in the sense you were talking about earlier, but say about eight or nine years ago, particularly around the time um, this album came out, um, I was much more into cause like the folk rock scene in the UK. Mm. So um, like, so I've spoken before in the Frank Turner episodes, Frank Turner and the Sleeping Souls, um, who like, like a, an artist who I listened to quite a lot and kind of sent me on kind of like a folk punk mm-hmm. like avant path and stuff. And quite a few of the friends I made along the way and people I kind of interacted with, the, the Gaslight Anthem were very, a set were like bands that fans of Frank Turner would also listen to. So there's quite a few people like that used to talk about the Gaslight Anthem, um, like the Menzingers and like kind of like the kind of like those on the cusp of the folk rock scene. Right, right. Um, cause, cause I think, cause I think Frank Turner himself gets compared to Bruce Springsteen quite a lot, but I never really delved into them, uh, that, that, re- that much really. Sure. Um, so, and I'm not sure why, um, I think, I think by the time, I think by the time I probably would have got around to him, I think my music taste started evolving away from the folk punk era <laughs> to perhaps what it is now. So uh, they sure. kind of passed me by, if I'm completely honest. Yeah. So it was I mean, not it was it was nice to go back and think, okay, what did I miss? Fair, fair. I mean, listen, listen, you know, anyone out there, there it's the same thing with TV and movies, right? There's so much. There's so much and here's the thing, there's so much great stuff that yes, you're gonna love it. This is for you. It, it, it has your name written all over it, but maybe you just didn't get around to it because of, I don't know, any, any particular reason. You were currently listening to something else. You were watching something else. It was on your radar, but then you kind of slipped past it a little bit. And that's okay. That's, that's totally okay. At the end of the day, all this content is still out there. It's still in the culture and it's still available to you. I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier in terms of. Oh, yeah how you relate to music because that's my bread and butter. I love kind of that kind, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff and hate. And the when you made the point that when you listen to music, if you can find something to latch onto or something that you connect with, that is pretty much how I assimilate music. And whilst I'm not, whilst, and I've said this many times, I'm not, I'm someone who could probably listen to an album for 20 years and not realize there's a snare drum playing because I'm not kind of that inclined because mm-hmm. my head doesn't go into into the minu- the minutiae of how music works mm. um, or different sounds. So I, can, I'm str- I struggle to pick out what music instruments and I can't tell a flute and a guitar. At a time. <laughs> but um, the thing that usually gets me is the melody and the lyric and sure. the storytelling. And a lot, a lot, um, if it's not the sound of quite a few, quite a few of the albums I've listened to in the past because of this podcast, um, if I've latched on to kind of the lyrical side of stuff, then that's a much better way of hooking me in. Um, for example, I mean, for example, I mentioned several episodes ago when I did the Billie Eilish album, I was umming and ahhing about whether whether I was lo- I was enjoying the album much. And then I think I st- once I started looking into the lyrics again and deeper, there was like and like hearing her speak about them and, and articles and stuff. I was like, oh yeah, okay, I'm starting to see, I'm starting to find some relatability in the lyrics and stuff. And it made me assess the songs and enjoy them mm. a lot more and hmm. i can totally get that kind of relationship with music and it's it's great when you kind of you probably you can listen to an album for a while and get the lyrics and then suddenly something happens and you're like and for a lack of it's the keanu reeves whoa <laughs> and then it's like when the song suddenly envelops you and you're like dude i totally get this song and it's like <laughs> yeah you go yeah, full yeah. keanu <laughs> you got full keanu on it and it's like whoa and it's like it's like that and i can and the the and a lot of my favorite albums have been moments where I'm like, crap, I live this out. Al- I love this album. I, this album speaks to me on so many levels of stuff. And I, I like, so I like, I kind of like that feeling. So is that, 
in terms of your relationship with music and mm-hmm. perhaps the Glad Anthem as well, to keep it on track, is that like the number one thing that hooks you in or is it just oh, a one point? To- it's the, it's a combination of things. Um, I, I, I am also a musician. So when I listen to music, I'm not just listening to the melody. I'm also listening to the harmony that's going with it. And I'm listening to the rhythm section and I'm listening to how the guitars – uh, are going about doing their thing or the piano or, or the synth or, or the keyboards, you know, what are, what are they all doing and how does each component connect with each other? So as opposed to listening to one whole piece, my brain starts to pick apart the different things. And this is, it, it, honestly, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword for me because there's a lot of great music out there that I might hear something and be like, you know, I, I just, I wasn't thrilled with this, uh, guitar solo, right? It didn't, it didn't get me the way that they wanted me to get it. And as a result, I don't like that song nearly as much as I could. Or it could be something as simple as, you know, I don't like the constant bop, 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 bop of a lot of pop music where it's always going, always going. You know, I want that dynamic range. I want to, I want to feel the downs and I want to feel those come ups, right? Um, I think, uh, 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 one song that really particularly sticks in my head is something that like immediately grabbed me because everything was kind of perfect in terms of the musicality and the lyric and the beat was actually Macklemore's Thrift Shop. And it's a, it's a fun song. It's, it's kind of a silly song, but, but it's, it's got such a cool, such a cool beat to it. Da, 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 da. And then it's still got that drive, that bop, 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 bop. But then when he comes in with his rap, like it's, you're fun. It's engaged. You're already clicked in. You're already like, yes, this is it. This is it. I feel the same way about a lot of, uh, a lot of Motown, a lot of doo-wop music. Like the rhythms are, are, they're, they're just bopping along. You know, you can tell everyone's having a good time. It's fun. It's engaging. It, it exists for the sake of existing, but also you're entertained, right? And when it comes to music like the Gaslight Anthem and, and the Heartland Rock or folk or indie rock or any of these things, uh, not only do you have to have that musicality attached to it, but you're, you're, you're almost as a musician writing that music, there's a little bit more pressure on you because you can't rely on some of those tropes that a lot of pop music can. You have to come at it with that story. You have to come at it with, uh, a guitar part that's interesting, that grabs your ear and doesn't let go. So there's a little bit more of a challenge in that because if everything sounded like the Beatles, then we would all be bored out of our minds, right? So you, <laughs> so I, I like that it's different. I like that it sounds unique in and of itself. Each record has and not just the gaslight anthem but each record has its own identity depending on who mixed it who produced it who were the writers on the album who were the background singers right there's all kinds of things that go into recording not just a song but a whole album and that's why you'll hear about bands like sequestering themselves away in the woods in the mountains for for six months while they write their new music because they're trying to capture a very specific sound for that whole piece and that is the stuff that i listen to and like i said earlier it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because when it works oh man does it work but if it doesn't you kind of feel like you got taken for a ride a little bit no yeah completely agree on that and um i find it interesting as well in terms of who created and who who created and worked on the album um so i had it so again i was looking on who the producer of um handwritten was and a guy called brendan o'brien mm-hmm. who has worked with acdc pearl jam uh bob dylan and Bruce Springsteen as well. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and looking at some of the stuff that he's done, you can kind of feel some of these albums, well, I say uh, majority of these albums I've not listened to, but the bands, um, Pearl Jam, for example, uh, Rage Against the Machine, um, Soundgarden, um, Papa Roach and Train, they kind of have that kind of like, there's a kind of guitar, like right. guitar sound to them and stuff, which I can kind of feel, go back, although... Then again, though, ACDC, again, guitar rock band. Mm-hmm. Perhaps not, probably not, doesn't sound as much as, um, as, doesn't sound that. But the one that, the one on this list that I have listened to, 
um, and do know, and I can kind of feel a very strong stylistic relationship to mm-hmm. this. And it, I think it was released in the same year. Is Battleborn by the Killers? Mm. Uh, again, another band that okay, they're not New Jersey, but they have a, such a strong. They have been compared to Springsteen in the past. Yes. Um, so and Battleborn, Battleborn felt like it was a it was harking back to the Samstown era of the Killers and. Um, again, it, whenever the killers show up, I am contractually obliged to mention that Sam Stone is like my second favorite album of all time. And check out <laughs> and check out the Kiara Get Stronger Talks About Music podcast because I guested on that podcast talking about that album okay. and just gushing about it for an hour. Um, yeah, so yeah, but it, it, it has that kind of sound. But it, okay, but not as good as that. But that Battleborn sound is I, seeing that now. I suddenly realize and listen, and then just thinking about handwritten, I can kind of feel. Mm-hmm. I can kind of feel the similarities between them and the kind of like the Sp- the Springsteen esque Heartland rock vibe stuff. Right. So right. Yeah. So I I can totally see where you mean what you mean with the producers having like a a sound to it. So does that mean that have they worked with different producers on every album then? Uh yes yes I I know that um they had changed I know that the Gaslight Anthem had changed record labels when they were getting into into handwritten I believe um they were with uh oh gosh yes yeah, side one dummy right and then they signed with Mercury Records and Mercury Records is is obviously it's it's a much bigger you know production company side one dummy uh I don't know them too well but I do know that they are an indie label uh based out of California oh okay so it was founded in 95 um that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, they had Flogging Molly, Go Go Bordello, Title Fight, a few others, and they did uh the annual Warp Tour compilation album. So, there you go. All all right in line with that with that very, you know, uh down to earth punk rock indie rock motif that they did. And the early stuff from the Gaslight Anthem, you have the 59 sound, which kind of put them on the map. Um and then they had American slang. And real quick tangent on American slang, there is a uh, there's a line in one of the songs, and it's um, uh, on Union Avenue when it turns to its disciples. I know exactly the street corner he's talking about, and how it, it and how there's like multiple streets that branch off of Union Avenue, um, and and it's it's. Another thing about living in New Jersey and knowing these guys are from New Jersey, you can kind of – like I can picture what they're writing about. Like the, one of the songs is basically uh, a love song about driving around with with your girlfriend or your, or your partner and, and listening to the music until kingdom come, right? That's all that matters. You're there in that moment and I can feel – where they are. I can, I can feel that like they're on route nine coming north and you see the city skyline of New York, you know, then you cross over, uh, uh, one of the, either the Gothels, if you want to go through Staten Island and you want to get out to Brooklyn or, you know, you're, 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 you're crossing over the Pulaski skyway and you see all the, all the sky rises start to come into play. Like I visualize it because I live here and I see it. And when I listen to that music, it feels like, sorry to be so on the nose with it but it feels like the anthem to my own life <laughs> <laughs> no i no no not on the nose at all it's perfectly fine yeah. perfectly fine to feel that and stuff in there so so in ter- so in terms of where they at where there was at with handwritten mm-hmm. um i was I, in terms of the research for this i've i've saw a reference to the fact that they 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 experiment but don't stray too far from a certain sound Mm. So they've either got, so they either get, so they're, they're not to, the the word that I saw, I can't remember which site I looked at, it says they never played safe, but they were never safe to begin with. That's an that's, interesting, that's, that's an interesting comment. Yeah. Yeah. So like they're not, so they're not kind of like mainstream rock, but they, mm-hmm. not mainstream rock, so they're not aimed to, but there's a certain sound which if you heard it on the radio, it would probably sound good on the radio. They're just not been on the mainstream level unless you're definitely not. So when I first heard, uh, the song 45, which is the first, uh, single that was released from this album, uh, it was on a now defunct alt rock radio station. Uh, 
and I think, unfortunately, like the way of all good radio stations playing alt rock, you know, they, they eventually just fizzled out and get bought out by whatever, uh, you know, junk pop music they want to play instead. So hearing that for the first time, it, it's definitely in your face. It's intense. And if you were to go back and listen to their previous work, it wasn't nearly as – this is not a negative comment, but it wasn't as produced or engineered in the same way. So the song 45, if you were to listen to that first and then you go back to like the 59 sound, you're going to hear a huge difference. And part of that I think is also Brendan O'Brien's influence. In that, as a record producer, when you're trying to hone in, when you're trying to get the best sound, the best talent, you don't want everything to be uh, uh, sounding like it's coming out of a garage. And that's what the first two albums kind of were. They 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 were drenched in that reverb. They had you know those big gang vocals with them, and on forty uh, on handwritten with the single forty five, you could tell that it was like all reined in. Like th this was a hit single that was made for radio, but it still feels like Gaslight Anthem. It's still it's still that raw, intense, you know, punk rock energy that they've always kind of embodied on stage. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the notes I had I had as well is that the album feels like anthemic, like you said for mm. like an anthem stuff. So it feels like it's you get songs and bands and albums that have that release something and it sounds like it's full of stuff that's meant to be shouted back at them mm -hmm. from an audience um with like arms in the air and stuff um yeah like people shouting like certain lines and choruses and yep. god i miss live music oh, so much God, um, so yeah and it, it, it's full, it's it's kind of, it has that kind of feel to it it has that kind of like larger venue mm. filling sound to it which, I'm assuming isn't on like the original albums where it's where it's kind of like it's it's the, the, the previous albums from what you tell me sound like there would probably be basement shows or like uh und like a small room under the bar um, yeah yeah kind of thing and so. and there's room for that there is I, I I think it's a lot of that music I I tend to gravitate more towards. Because for me, I think uh, my musical journey has been finding authenticity in the music and finding those moments of honesty and truth that not just speak to me, but are also true to the band. There's a lot of, you know, um, uh, I'm thinking, uh, what's a big rock band, right? Shine Down. Shine Down is a, is a huge, you know, international, you know, rock metal band right now. And yeah, phenomenal. They're great, but I don't connect with them. I don't, some songs I'm like, yeah, you know, like, and, and intellectually I can say this is a phenomenal album. This is a phenomenal song. They did a great job. Everything is perfect, but it's perfect. And I don't know that for me, I don't necessarily want perfection. I want to hear some rawness. I want to hear the sound that the amplifier makes when you're plugging in the chord and you hear that zzzz before the music starts and and when you hear the kind of fingers scraping along the exactly. strings when they change and this stuff yeah. exactly exactly because that means that somebody took the time to put a microphone there to pick that up you know or it might mean that the guitar was eq'd in such a way that they really wanted to pick that up or it could just be you know a uh, part of the record and it was either intentional or not either way there is something very true to music in that when everything is polished to perfection i'm less interested looking through genius.com um someone made an interesting comment from uh, i can't remember what song it was it might have what song it was from but uh it may have been uh Biloxi parish mm. Um, but, um, but it's something that I think I wanted to ask you as a, as a album as a whole. Um, the user was Jay Tanner and said, a common gaslight anthem trait is an elegiac narrator. Here, the narrator is romanticizing his younger self and believes he's peaked. Hmm. Now, elegiac is something I had to Google how to pronounce and I feel like I might have mispronounced it, but the definition is it's relating to a characteristic of an elegy, hmm. which, and Googling elegy, because I had to double check what it meant. Um, a poem a serious reflection, typically a lament for the dead. Mm. And like, for example, the comment saying that common through the Gaslight Anthem is that it's a lot, it's very retrospective. Nostalgia is the Nostalgic. word I would use. Yeah. Nostalgic. No. 
a hundred percent. I think, I think that person, uh, I mean, one hell of a rabbit hole of language to stumble down too. I, I learned some new words today. Um, Nostalgia is the word I would use, and you can definitely hear that throughout their discography. You can tell that there's this element of, I wish I could go back. I wish I could be younger. I wish I could, you know, grasp that moment in time and freeze it. And maybe that's why I connect with it so much because it's, it's so easy to look back on these fond moments of your youth. And, you know, the loved ones that you spent time with, uh, your best friends, I mean, going to basement shows is a rite of passage, you know, and here in New Jersey, there, there's nothing but basement shows all the time. Um, all, all the, all the clubs and the venues, you either go from a basement show and then you go to maybe a couple of bars here or there. And then there's precious few like indie rock clubs you can get into that every band is trying to beat down the door, right? So those moments where you're building your, your brand as a musician or you're meeting with your friends and you, and you just want to have a good time for a lot of, music fans for a lot of kids in the scene back in the day that that was you were going to the basement you were partying you were passing around cheap beer and and just having a blast sharing cigarettes can you remember sharing things with people because i can't (laughs) but um yeah that that youthful energy and there's a little bit of darkness there too where maybe you have these past regrets where you treated your friends maybe poorly when you should have been more kind or you didn't understand what they were going through and so maybe you lashed out and that is here in the music as well um in the lyrics for Biloxi Parish it opens up with I've been fondling with your heartstrings and that's good enough for me I mean, let's unpack that for a second. This guy, the protagonist here, he's fondling with your heartstrings and that's good enough for me. So obviously this isn't like a relationship that he really, really cares about. He's just having fun, you know? And in the music, when you listen to the song, you can tell that he actually really cares about her because it goes on and it says, I'll be with you through the dark so that you do not go through the dark alone. Right. So the the emotional impact and the weight that Brian is singing about in this song on on, on the girl that he's singing it to, he regrets that he, he, you know, like he should not have fondled with the heartstrings. And it's funny to say the lyric like that, because this uh, fondle, I think, is a is a term that conjures a very specific uh, sentiment. Right. But it works in the context of the song to deliver the message of what he's saying. Um, yeah, no, that's a, it's a good comment, but nostalgia is really what is the key word that comes to mind when I listen through their albums. So as we, as we go into the songs, which songs jump out to you or which songs do you want to talk about? Mm, uh, we definitely got to talk about 45, uh, and handwritten, which is the title track, of course, uh, and Mulholland Drive and May are definitely the songs I would I would say uh, 100% we got to talk about. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, which one do you want to talk, do you want to mention first? Uh, well, I guess let's start right at the top with, uh, with 45. The beginning of the beginning. The beginning of the beginning. Beginning of the beginning. This is the first single that they dropped. To be honest with you, I don't actually know if they had a proper second radio single, but this is what, uh, what all the rock stations were pushing. Um, it showed up in, in various, uh, playlists on, on the early versions of Spotify, uh, in the new rock section. But I, th- I do think actually thinking about it, depending on the type of shows mm. that I went to, I'm sure this was a, like, this was a song that they would play mid sets when like mm-hmm. the next band would set up. So, yeah. so like when it would be like the playlist that either the promoter would set up or it, I, I, or whether, I don't know whether some venues allow the, the, the headlining band to actually choose the, the mid right the set right. mid set music because that's the only time I ever that's the only time I ever shazam anything was when I was so interested <laughs> on my own yeah but um yeah I'm pretty so forty five I'm pretty sure was something I may have heard in the past you you before as well it's probably in in your brain there somewhere yeah but this is definitely and talking about nostalgia mm. and 
put into effect that this was released in the middle of 2012 and probably written a year, year and a half before this was released. And I am trying to figure out when the resurgence of vinyl kicked in. Mm. Because this song's about basically singles on 45s and there's a very nostalgic kind of or <laughs> almost... It's basically as if someone wrote... Someone put a song about VHSs today. No, hey, if someone <laughs> wrote a song about DVDs today. Um, it's that same sentiment. But um, interestingly, I was trying to remember, and this is where we should really have Paul or Tim from We, we Buy Records on the phone, just to tell us... Um, uh, another show on the We Made It Network, um, just to re- tell us when this kind of resurgence yeah, right. of vinyl kicked in. So I don't know whether this was just before, just before that where it suddenly was cool to have vinyl again. But there's definitely a kind of nostalgic element of like, oh, yeah, yeah, like turn the record, like turn your record over turn and having to over. get off, get up off your ass, mm-hmm. go to the record player That's and right. make the effort to put the music on again <laughs> and stuff. But yeah, when you mentioned that nostalgic stuff, this is kind of like a nostalgia for music, but the physical aspect of it. Thinking about it, it might actually, it's, I don't want to say, I don't, I don't mean it's in a negative way. It's, it's almost dated about a song that was meant to be about a dated physical release. Sure. If that makes sense. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, but, I mean, you know, the song is titled 45 because it's referencing the act of, you know, you need to turn the record over. Uh, but the chorus, hey, hey, turn the record over, hey, hey, and I'll see you on the flip side. There you go. Turn the key and engine over. Let her go. Let somebody else lay at her feet. That is not a song about an actual vinyl record. That's a song about like leaving your ex-girlfriend in the past and letting her go. Turn the mm-hmm. record over, meaning move on, bro. Tell the yeah, again the metaphors. The host always find always mm-hmm. find it. I mean, I never actually really thought about it until you mentioned the nostalgia stuff. But um, again, you're right though. It's it's like I was saying earlier. It's drenched across their discography. Like like it definitely feels as though writing in the songs, they're always looking backward. They're always looking at backward. What might have been? What could have been? What should have been? I I, or I I actually quite like the chorus of this as well because it kind of builds up, mm-hmm. builds into the kind of like almost catchy. I don't want to say pop. I don't want to say pop, but it's it's got a kind of. You can sing to it. To you it. can dance yeah. to it. You know, you can you yeah. can raise your fist in the air just just like you would at a rock show. Hey, hey, turn the record over. You know, like like you would have a good time with that. You know, you can sing that yeah. out. Yeah. But yeah, so it's uh, and I can see how why they chose it as single. It has a single vibe to mm. it. But so yeah, so uh, where do you want to go next? Ooh, let's talk about handwritten next because uh, that is. I want to say that as as a title track to an album, it's kind of it's kind of bombastic. It comes in a little heavy. It comes in a little hot. It's got those moments, that dynamic range in the bridge when when it takes you out of all those heavy guitars, and then it boom, drops you right back in. So this, to me, is one of those classic rock and roll songs that really just, they're begging you to get up and dance to this song, to sing along, to to, to feel your feelings in this. And nostalgia, right? Like like we, we've been talking about it so much. And I think that the the title of the song, Handwritten, is a little nostalgic in and of itself because, I mean, you know, in 2012 or... 2011 when they wrote it maybe not so much but today 2021 nine years after this record was released i i i don't really hand write anymore if i'm handwriting it's like quick notes or or jotting ideas down or 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 post-it notes right yeah it's it's yeah i think the few writing I do is what is jotting down notes when my guests on this podcast there you mention go. something that I might want to re- refer to late. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Or but basically writing down the song they picked for the Hall, Hall of Fame. But, and on the flip side, though, I mean, to be fair, if you've ever seen my handwriting, I'm so glad that handwriting is lesser because <laughs> <laughs> I got so much stick of that at school for my handwriting being absolutely poor. 
And I'm like, and as an adult, part of me is kind of like, it's like trigonometry. You're never going to... Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's not the most important thing. I, Have you I recently <laughs> converted, like when I do hand right now, I do all capital letters because it forces me to slow down so I can read it when I pick it up later. Because if I just write, it'll be like, nah, 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 like a doctor, you know, it's just like writing a prescription. But if it's all caps, I can read it. Hmm. But yeah, but and, um, again, referring back to the the aspect of nostalgia, um, the term handwritten. Mm-hmm. Handwritten, I think the first thing that you kind of go to is letters mm-hmm. and the act of writing a letter, which has has been like, was like the biggest, like the longest lasting form of long term of long range communication that we had as a species, as a society. And it, it conjures, it conjures a certain nostalgia. I need to, I need to find a thesaurus. <laughs> um, um, alternative word for nostalgia. Is that good luck laid them? Oh. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it does conjure that and it just helps build to, to that as well. And it being, the title track sure you kind of have that feeling of it particularly i mean i think instant messenger instant messaging had been around for like what 10 years from now before then but like so like msn and stuff but oh yeah i think it was only i think we were still perhaps a couple of years off before kind mm-hmm. of the popularity of whatsapp and the instant messaging right. aspects came onto phones and stuff um, so it was, it was text messaging, but there was never really the group chat was not a thing. Um, so, we, um, so yeah, it was still. It's very weird to think that 2012 is still feels like a different generation ago, depending. It's only like right? nine years ago it was written. So, like, yeah, and I think I think Gen, I think I think mainly because we're now in Gen Z rather than the millennial right aspect, but they still feel like like an aspect of an era where it's it's kind of nostalgic for an era whilst it was in a previous era as well. Mm-hmm. And it's and that kind of scares me a little bit actually. But uh, <laughs> but I do Don't again, think too I, hard I, about it. Yes. Yeah, I can yeah, as I said before, I, when I do I can feel my hair graying. But um but yeah, I think the that the imagery of the handwritten stuff and again it again it has a very good hook and a chorus to it that brings it in as well. And I don't think even if it wasn't released as a single, it's one it's a song that has a music video to it. Yeah. Yeah. So they Clearly, try. They clearly had it in mind to try and push it out as a single. One of the reasons this song really grabs me is because it, in and of itself, is a bit of an ode to songwriting. The lyrics here, you know, it opens up. It opens here, right? Pull it out, turn it up. What's your favorite song? He's talking about, you know, what what cassette do you want to listen to? What CD do you want to listen to? Tell me what your favorite song is. And he says, that's mine. I've been crying to it since I was young, meaning he loves music. He's been listening to music forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And the, the follow up, this is all in the first verse. I know there's someone out there feeling just like I feel. I know they're waiting up. I know they're waiting to heal like that. That's what music is, man. Like, like it really talks to your, your, your being, your soul. Music is the language of the universe. Everyone out there is feeling some kind of way. And there's a song that they can connect with and grasp onto and, and just, and just love and feel it and feel that healing, right? And, you know, the rest of the song, we only write by the moon, every word handwritten, you know, it, it, it conjures up this image of this, tortured poet you know sitting on the hood of his 59 cadillac under the moonlight desperately writing the lyrics that will become the song of a generation right that's it's a big song like i said it's bombastic it's got that dynamic later on it gets a little quieter i can understand you need a minute to breathe and to sew up the seams after all this defeat man just like let that sit with you for a second Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly, exactly, <laughs> right? Like, like you can feel that. Yeah. So, you know, when, when I listen to music, you know, there have been songs in the past that have moved me so, and I felt tears or, or I felt fulfillment or I felt, um, happy or, or, or it helped me unleash some of the pent up frustration and anger I was holding on to. We all have those songs that we connect with and, they are all equally valid. And that's what the song really, to me, that's what it is. It's, it's an ode to songwriting. 
Yeah, and I quite, and he's saying with that line to own this defeat as well. It's I think that's pretty much that is pretty much how singer songwriters if do like like you had the mantra of oh everyone makes mistakes and like there's uh, I can't remember off the top of my head where it's the famous Michael Jordan quote where people go oh Michael Jordan failed whatever three hundred failed three hundred shots or something he goes yeah but I'm the best because I failed so many times because if without failure you don't have that and yeah yeah you kind of and it's it's the ability to take that failure and and to grow with it it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a very good way of encapsulating that feeling of perhaps songwriting. And say I'm not much of a songwriter. I mean, perhaps one day, perhaps one day on the podcast, I might randomly throw in the song that I once written about cakes, which is currently hitting on, it's just currently on private on SoundCloud for about six years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, which is the, which is the extent of my songwriting. Yeah, maybe not. Actually, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if the podcast gets so many thousand downloads at a certain point, maybe I'll release that. There you that. go. And you can hear my, you can hear my song called "Cakes Are Awesome." But that's, um, yeah, put it but, out uh, there, yeah. man. G- give it, give it to the culture. <laughs> Just give it to the culture. <laughs> yeah, get it trending on TikTok. Um, <laughs> oh god, oh, no, no. Um, so yeah, so uh, the song, the ode to songwriting. So, uh, what else do you want to talk about on the album? Uh, so my my favorite song, uh, Mulholland Drive is is on is on this this album interestingly as well is that my first note was that i really like this one interesting <laughs> i really like this album i really dislike this song it was really so good. let me ask you what, what 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 connected with you on this song again i think it might have been the hook and the the chorus and it's the the repeated line of the uh, took your love away mm. and stuff it kind of remembers in your kind of remains in the head and again because that's because my instance is lyrics yeah. and the hook and stuff I mean, and it's, the melody of it. It's a great hook. Oh, that i just die if you ever took your love away. Yeah, it's it's a great hook. It really is. And and that's, you know, again, when it comes down to uh actually, I think uh one of your one of your previous guests when you guys were talking Bob Seeker, they talked about um the like like the more working class uh, type of a vibe like Bob Seger, you, you could see him walk off a of factory line. He di- he wasn't singing about uh, uh the girls or the groupies or or partying all the time or whatever drugs he was doing. It was about being on the road. It was about being in that moment and feeling those feelings. And this song, actually, Gaslight Anthem in general, like I I feel you know that is still an apt description, right? Like you could you could take everything your guest said about Bob Seger and, and apply it to the Gaslight Anthem and it would kind of just match, it would work. Um but this tune here it is my personal favorite and may, there there's it takes me to it takes me to a place uh when I when I was much much younger. Uh I was like maybe 18, 19, something like that. And there, there was a, uh, the girl I was seeing at the time. Um, you know, we, we shared a lot of those parking lot moments because when you're 18, 19, you have to be 21 to drink in the U S. So when you get out of high school and before you turn 21, there's this weird, like, what are we, what are we doing? Like, are we going out? Are we staying it? Like you don't have money, so you can't really go out and do things, but you want to be social. You, you, you want, you want to be engaged. So what we would do is sometimes we would go to dinner and then next thing you know, we're spending an hour or two in the parking lot and, you know, making out, kissing, you know, hands around my neck. I felt the pounding of your heart and the summer night was given into the lure of autumn sway. That's a lyric from the song and it takes me back to, you know, late August early September, uh, hanging out with, with my ex and just spending that time together. Um, you know, and when you're young and you're in love, you know, you think everything is going to be perfect and it's going to be great and you're not worried at all about the future. And so the hook here, you know, that I just die, if you ever took your love away, would you miss me if I was gone and all the simple things were lost? Would you ever wait on me to say that I just die if you ever took your love away? Like that, that is, it's young love there and there's nothing more beautiful than young love, right? 
So you can connect with it. You can find in this song your own relationship. Um, and e- even now with, with, with my now wife, you know, I listen to it and, you know, I can feel some of these feelings, you know, it's, I would just die if you ever took your love away. If I lost my wife, I would be devastated, you know, like literally I would probably die. So to be scared to need someone. So you killed it all instead. Another line, you know, to, if, if you're afraid of loving someone and you don't give in, what could you lose? You know, what, like, all that great emotion, this great life that I have with, with my own partner and, and, and our house and our dogs and all the memories we have together. If I was afraid to love, I wouldn't have that. So at the same time, this song is, is telling you it's okay. It's okay to take that leap. It's okay to take that jump. So yes, while it's reflective and it's looking back on the past in, in such a way, it's also one of those great, great love songs. It's a great American love song. And there is nothing more beautiful about music than a great love song. Or maybe I'm just a hopeless romantic. I don't know. So something that you mentioned earlier and something that was brought up in the Manchester Orchestra episode with Ed, um, and I think a couple of the times the podcast as well, is that, and I feel this might be a song, one of the songs you're referring to, is when you talk about when you revisit songs and you start to lean new meaning in them as you grow with age mm. and they become more in depth and you start finding more layers yeah. to them. Um, am I right in saying that Mulholland Drive is one of those songs that you feel you start appreciating even more because you can relate to the lyrics on a different level? I agree with that statement very much. Very much. Yes. Yes. I hear, I feel a different feeling when I hear it. Uh, I, I generally, the, th- the thing, the thing with music, and I, I feel like a lot of people are the same way. If you love an album, you'll listen to it over and over and over. And then you'll be like, okay, I'm done listening to that album. And then you might revisit it six months, a year later, or you might completely forget about it. And then you come back to it and you're like, Oh, that's new. That's an interesting thing. I do feel that. I, I listen to this album fairly regularly. It comes up, uh, I wouldn't say like every day or anything like that. But when I, when I hear this song, I think immediately of driving. I think of, you know, all the great loves of my life. I think about all, 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 all that I lost in my life, but I also think about all that I gained in my life and, and, and all the greatness that has come about. So yes. I look at it in new ways. I feel it in new ways. And that's a great song. That's a great song, Matt. Wow. And I th- I think with that, I think it's th- we move on to another song because I don't think we can we can we can't beat that. I think so that was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, I I I uh I hear you. I hear you. That that's It was May was you the one you said you wanted to yeah. you wanted to mention, wasn't it? Yeah, I this is another great another great love song. Um, and immediately upon listening to it, you, you can conjure up the image of, uh, of two lovers just, just driving. Like that, that's, that's what I hear. I, I see either they're together or, or maybe, you know, may, maybe it's one person driving to the other so they can meet or he's waiting for her to come to him or, or whatever. Um, but it's, this song feels like a time capsule because it has references to Betty Davis and party dresses, it has references to being on the radio. Um, and in, in one of the, one of the verses in my faded jeans and faraway eyes and salty carnival kiss like that. Ha- so New Jersey has this beautiful Jersey shore and, uh, it's probably really popular to your podcast listeners based off of a terrible TV show, uh, from the mid two thousands called wait for it, Jersey shore. So, uh, down our way, uh, on the Jersey shore, we have a lot of great, uh, a lot of great boardwalks, um, you know, think arcade games. You've got, uh, you got ski ball, which for those who may be unfamiliar, it's basically, uh, a game of sort of skill, mostly luck where you toss a heavy ball. It's about the size of a, of a, of a baseball. Um, you, you toss it underhand. So it rolls up of a ramp and it lands inside of, of, of like this little, this little hole. And, and each hole is pointed differently. So the really, the small one is a hundred points. 
and the big ones that you know, you're, you're going to wipe out on are like 10 points. So anyway, uh, lots of arcades, roller coasters, Ferris wheels, things of that nature. So, and they're, they're right, right on the Atlantic ocean. Like you, you go up on this Ferris wheel, you can see out, you know, on a beautiful night, you can see for miles and miles and miles and miles. It's beautiful. So, uh, in the line, when he's saying in my faded jeans and faraway eyes and my salty carnival kiss, you know, that it, it, takes you to a place of, you know, being on the boardwalk of the Jersey Shore, you know, and being right next door to New York City, you have people who commute, you have people who come back and forth. So in one of the first verses, um, the lyric is, while the city pumps its aching heart for one more drop of blood, we work our fingers down to dust and we wait for kingdom come with the radio on. As someone who pre-pandemic commuted in New York City, worked his ass off, and interestingly, when this album came out in 2012, uh, I was, I was a, um, I was, I was, I was a simple young man, just driving around the city, uh, dropping off and picking up a lot of audiovisual equipment, you know, for like festivals and, and, you know, different gigs here and there and symposiums and everything. Uh, so I would drop off, you know, heavy audio video gear. And I would listen to this album very regularly. Like I worked hard, man, you know, and I connected, you know, we work our fingers down to dust, you know, and we wait for kingdom come. What are, you know, come on, like, what are we all waiting for? You know, we're all waiting to die. And that's a very bleak statement, you know, but then you have this chorus, right? So you go from that, this very bleak sense of we're, we're working and we're killing ourselves into this chorus. I want to see you tonight. Would you come for a drive? You can lean into me if you ain't been in love for a while. And my takeaway from this is let's connect. We are two people. We love each other. And this is all we have in life is each other. One thing that I thought I thought it might have been about, and um, I think genius probably leans towards your more variety, is that I thought it was about two like lost souls just connecting not in a romantic in a romantic way just to just to connect yeah. with someone and that's that's good so. too i mean it's you're not wrong you're not wrong you know the, the, these two may not necessarily be romantically involved but uh maybe they could be yeah so yeah i, I never realized that so but then again again it makes it makes sense considering it's from the rest of the song but i've always thought yeah when i was listening to it it was like oh this might just be someone just finding a connection when they just haven't had one for a while yeah. which when you think when when you apply that to the current current situation oh, yeah. I mean, like see current situation stuff where like, you're gonna have a load of people who are who are kind of like just like just waiting to go and connect with people mm-hmm. um some people who might not be i mean i'm I mean, I, I I live on my own. I'm not I'm not in a rush. <laughs> <laughs> I'm run, I'm I'm gradually running out of reasons to be antisocial. Um, so <laughs> I'm dreading the va- I'm dreading the vaccine. It's, it's another excuse. Get the vaccine. I kids. hear you. I um, hear you. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I just think that, but that's that's how I connect mm. connect with that as well. So um, and I think with I think with that um, I think yeah, the song I kind of wanted to cover was my whole drive mm. more than anything because i quite like that song um i think we should we, we should move on to the reception of the sure. album and the it received mostly positive reviews from music critics at metacritic which assigns a weighted average blah 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 uh the album received a meta score of 71 out of 100 based on 31 reviews indicating generally favorable mm-hmm. reviews if you look on uh metacritic the the, the critic reviews it's the meta score it's based on 30, 31 but you've got 19 positive and 12 mixed the mixed are kind of like the hit on the the upper side like on the 60s and in the 60s the only ones where it's um mm. really down is uh the spin under the radar the observer and mojo i think the observer as as we as we found in previous episodes, the Observer, part of the Guardian, they don't seem to like New Jersey apparently <laughs> because they also uh, <laughs> the the they get they the, if the Black Parade review they gave it one out of five, which is uh, wow, <laughs> um, yeah that, that 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 review is quite savage actually, um, but yeah and it's like there's the Pitchfork review. I'm not going to quite the Pitchfork review, but the Pitchfork review as always is interest is interesting to kind of get your emotions up because it's get your emotions up because it's it's not the most uh it's not the most complimentary about the album but on the upper side because we hear more sure. about, 
we're here more about positivity more than anything. Yeah, Absolute Punk is got is the only one with a hundred, and I can't get onto the review because it seems to have vanished. But um, the only thing on Metacritic for the Absolute Punk review, which is a hundred out of hundred, has as listeners, as fans of music, we've already hit the lottery here, and that's all it says. But yeah, DIY and BBC AV Club have given it all the highs. Um, DIY gave it nine. Well, DIY is down as ninety. The lyrics are a lot more personal. The band a little more developed. It seems as this is the start of a new and exciting chapter for the Gaslight Anthem. BBC, the criticisms are minor. A couple of tracks slide back into familiar Americana, but even then, there is no sense of the band coasting. Um, AV Club are down to eighty three. Handwritten, the lyrics are finally settled into a perfect spot between craft and cathesis, and the music isn't far behind. Um, for the user reviews. Um, eight point three overall. There's a load of positives, mm-hmm. one mixed and one negative. Um, let me just quickly sort by user score. <clears throat> so some of the higher ones, uh, some of the higher ones have been quite complimentary as well. Uh, really good album, good songs. The album says it all, handwritten with good songs. Best songs off this album and recommend buying off iTunes are May Forty Five, handwritten Mulholland Drive. If you're a fan of rock and roll and blues, then buy this album. Even if you're a Bruce Springsteen fan, <laughs> you, wrote, <laughs> you didn't write that, did you? I know, right? <laughs> it's just the songs. We, it's the songs we've spoken about. Uh, and that was C reviews. Um, and out of curiosity, let me just can I sort. Can I find the la- the last? Hey, curiosity. I want to see what the negative one said. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a little bit of negative stuff here. Like uh, the Observer out of the UK says, Gaslight seems so hell bent on heroics. They often end up more Bon Jovi than Boss. And I'm kind of like, did you did did we listen to the same thing? You know, like like I don't know what, where you're getting this heroics come from. It's an interesting interesting take, but you know, like most things, um, music. Music critics and reviews, they have their place. I've never given them much stock. Never. Like maybe every so often if, if, if I, if I really love a record, I'll go and find out what other people are, are talking about it with. But at the end of the day, if you love it, you love it. You don't have to apologize for yeah, it. Yeah. You know? No, it's very fine. Yeah. I just find sometimes I just find particularly the user reviews if user reviews and if they're negative they're a lot more they're quite mm. fun to to read but um, it's a, and it's it's uh, chart positions and stuff did quite well um, so it reached number one on the Scottish albums hey my man for the uh, official charts it reached number one in the UK rock and metal albums um, which I was surprised I never actually really listened to it then but hmm. um, so it, Number one in the US top alternative albums, number one in the US top rock albums. Um, came number two in the UK album, uh, number two in the German albums, uh, number three in the US Billboard 200, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It reached 103 in Belgium. Okay. So, yeah, uh, 82 in Italy as well. So, And it reached s- s- silver in United Kingdom, so it reached silver certification. Um, I can't remember what the exact number is for that, but it sold eight, eight, at the moment, it is based on Wikipedia, sold 80,163, so that might be slightly out of date, but, um, yeah, so it's, uh, so it's, 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 it's done well for a band of that yeah, size. I think yeah. That, that size, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. Absolutely. I, I do think it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a shame that, you know, they've all gone their, their separate ways and the band is, is no longer, uh, together. Um, and I understand where Brian is coming from when he says like, uh, you know, we, 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 we ended the band because we didn't have any more things for the Gaslight Anthem to say. Which, you know, he, he, he went off and, and is doing his solo work. And my, my point, my rebuttal would be, well, your solo work is you, but also it sounds very much like a stripped down Gaslight Anthem record. So I, I almost wonder, like, if, if his solo work had those guys behind him, would, would there be, would there be more to come? Because right now it's, it's, the state of rock and punk music seems a little iffy at the moment. Uh, when, when I think about these, this type of sound where it's guitar driven and melody oriented with these real emotional lyrics to speak of, I 
currently cannot think of a band that is out there right now doing the same thing that the Gaslight Anthem did, right? And, you know, please, if, uh, if when this episode drops, if, you know, folks want to tweet at me and say, Hey, check these guys out, I would love to see that. But I think that there is still room for more Gaslight Anthem in, in the musical culture. And, and I do hope that they get back together. But dealing with a lot, all the criticisms of, Oh, well, you guys are just a Bruce Springsteen, you know, rock band. It's like, ah, I get why they would want to, they would want to separate themselves a little bit. Yeah. Interesting to hear that. So I'm interested to see if anyone actually knows of any bands and, and let us know. Um, have you ever, did you ever see them live? Unfortunately, no, no. Uh, I remember getting tickets to, uh, one of their summer concert series in, in Asbury Park. And I remember, unfortunately, having to give them away because I had to work. So that was a bummer. Uh, and then they, they broke up before I had an opportunity to see them again. Uh, so if they suddenly if they suddenly announce a reunion, you're gonna be oh, there. Oh, I'll be there. Front row. They did announce they were gonna do the um the ten year of the fifty nine sound uh record release, and that was I think maybe two years ago. And um, like all like all things, I was just like, oh, the band broke up and they're not doing anything, so I stopped kind of following their feeds and everything. And then they announced it, and it went right by me. I didn't even notice it until after the fact, and I was like, son of a bitch. Well, next year it's tenth anniversary of this album, yeah, so maybe who knows? maybe. So if if they if they reform to fifty nine sound, maybe they're still open to, so. to celebrate this album. So fingers crossed for you, Mike. Thank you. Fingers Thank crossed. You. So we've touched upon the other albums on there, but other albums briefly. But after listening to this, if people want to hear any other other albums, where would you recommend they go after Handwritten. Uh, so handwritten kind of landed, uh, right in the middle of their discography, uh, if not more leaning towards the end. But the only other album they have after that is called Get Hurt, which, uh, uh, musically speaking, I did not like as much as I liked handwritten. Uh, there's some great songs on there, a lot of really big, you know, energy, intense music. Uh, and the title track itself, Get Her, it's very, it's an introspective. Uh, Brian Fallon wrote it after, after going through a divorce and, uh, dealing with some substance issues. So it had, it carries a lot of that energy to it. Um, and you can hear it. You can tell. If you want to go earlier, American Slang is a beautiful record. Uh, one of the, one of the tracks off of that, the Diamond Church Street Choir, uh, a close friend of mine, Anthony, he knows the guys that they're talking about when they sing that song. So that's a cool, that's a cool little thing. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I would highly recommend American Slang. The 59 sound is, I think you have to be ready for it. It's definitely, it was their breakthrough album. They hit it big with that record. I think that there is a lot in it that you really, you need to be an active listener. If you passively listen and you just have it on in the background while you're doing other stuff or driving or something, you may not get the full impact. And something, and we mentioned this earlier, I'm a definitely a big proponent of actively listening, sitting down, like, you know, turn your mobile device off for a change and just listen. Because the things that musicians are talking about are real, they're prescient, and they're, they can carry a lot of emotional weight that maybe you can give to that song. So you don't have to carry it yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Okay, so yeah, um, it'd be interesting to see. It depends, so it depends which route you want to go, whether you yeah. go forward or backward, depending what you see. That there's been a few time, few times where people have answered that in terms of that. So if you like this aspect of an album, mm-hmm. go forward. If you like that aspect, go backwards. Or you got people going, just listen to everything. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 one of those it's one of those interesting questions anyway. So and we're gearing up to the end of our conversation Mike um it's been great but we here but the main reason everyone's here is the important question now mm. it's a very important Already. question which is the song for the Hall of Fame playlist on Spotify for anyone listening who's not listened to us before what this is is that i asked Mike to contribute a song to go onto the playlist uh on the Spotify Hall of Fame so i can't veto it so whatever Mike says goes all right so well i think you know what it's going to be it's going to be Mulholland Drive Holland Drive. Got to, got to pick it. Good choice. Got to pick it. Honestly, I was thinking about it, and and I, May is another one of those songs. And folks, you know, 
again, feel free to tweet at me how you feel about it. I'd love to hear and, and discuss anything. Uh, but May is another one of those songs that, that I just feel, you know, I get all up in my own feels about it. And, and that is one, it was between that and Mulholland Drive for the playlist. But ultimately, Mulholland Drive wins out. Great drive, great intensity. Uh, lyrics really speak to me and I hope they speak to you. Um, yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Okay. So Mulholland Drive joins, joins the Spotify Hall of Fame playlist as I think the 66th song. Yes. On there. Nice. Yes. Which. I was trying to count whether that is actually true, but then I do know that the, there's at least, yeah, the, the, yeah, because there's one song where I load, one episode I load two. I think it's 66, I think. I, if I, if not, I can't count. But, uh, yeah, so it, and it follows, and it follows, um, the Blue Tones as Ooh, well. Nice. Um, so, uh, the song we haven't actually recorded the episode for yet, but, um, <clears throat> but, uh, so I can't, even, I, I can't have that sense of continuity <laughs> that I might like to have during these episodes. Um, film, film, recording these out of order because to just, just to land on the, uh, anniversary of the album. Um, but yeah, so we've come to the end of our conversation, Mike, and it's been great chatting to you. It's, it's great to like finally listen to what people that I know have been listening to for ages. Um, someone that I follow on Twitter who I, who I met. Years ago, through the Frank, T- like through Frank Turner, he's their username used to be um, every word handwritten. Mm. Um, I think they had a yeah, I think they had a blog with the, the name every every word Beautiful. handwritten as well, where they where they um, where they used to handwrite um, the blog wow. posts and take a picture of them and handwrite them. So yeah, so it was nice to actually listen to the song behind huh. that. Um, so yeah, so um, if people want to find you, want to contact you. Uh, give you suggestions of and yell at you saying no this band sounds exactly like the gas, <laughs> gaslight anthem where can where can they send those yes yes <laughs> yes you can uh i mean the, the only social platform that i'm really connected to is twitter uh you can find me at mike slamer m-i-k-e-s-l-a-m-e-r uh please feel free um i'm also on instagram but that's more of like a personal like friends and family thing and i i don't i left facebook a long time ago uh and quite frankly uh the only reason i i kind of even like social media is for stuff like this for creatives to share their work and their knowledge and um you know, whether it's a podcast or a piece of art or their own music, because also I am a musician and I hope you listen to my music and you can find it by following me on Twitter. Yeah. And you also have a part of some of the shows on the We Made This I podcast. I do. I do. I am a part of the We Made This network. Uh, it's, it's a great, great network where I've met some fine people like yourself, Matt. And, uh, I, and, Ta- and Tony Black. But we don't, we talk, don't about talk about him because he never comes on <laughs> podcasts anymore. <laughs> um, uh, so I host We Are Starfleet, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. I'm a big sci-fi nerd. I love it. I love science fiction and I love Star Trek in general. It's so great. It's so cool. It's exciting. Um, and I also host uh, Gotham University, which is a Batman podcast. And that's all centered around the Batman Right. But it's also a little bit educational. We get in the comics, we get in the movies, uh, and we, we talk about a little bit of the history and, you know, uh, especially with the movies, like they basically just keep telling the same story over and over and over. So it's like, what other stories are out there? And we get into that too. Um, we just recently did a comic review on the court of owls, which released as part of the new 52 a number of years ago. And I got to say, as someone who's not a big comic reader, that was an awesome thing to read. It was very engaging. And you can find that at Gotham U pod, uh, available on all podcast platforms. You can follow that show on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, feel that. I've not, um, I've not listened to Gotham University yet, but I keep meaning to. Yeah, so yeah, feel feel free to follow, give those a listen. If give those podcasts a listen, if you're into Batman or Star Trek or um, Batman in Space, is an hmm. idea that they probably should have. Or Batman in the Star. Interesting. Uh, Batman, Batman Star Trek crossover. Batman on the Moon. It's probably been done oh, somewhere. Yeah, a hundred percent. Someone's got a comic about that, and it's probably as awful as it sounds. Yeah. But I'd like to read it. Batman in space. <laughs> but with that, I think it's time for us to say goodbye, Mike. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you for coming on to talk about Gaslight Thank Anthem. you for having me. 
You've been listening to Pick a Disc and I've been your host, Matthew Layman. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made This Podcast Network and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash We Made This. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash Pick a Disc. You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under Pick a Disc. You can also email us on pickadisc at gmail.com. Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye. Hello everyone, this is Tony, Network Chief of We Made This. As you know, our podcast network brings together a brilliant assortment of talent who talk about all kinds of pop culture content, such as the episode you just listened to. We're not going anywhere, but we'd love to keep the lights on for even longer if you're able to support our network on Patreon. For just £2 a month, you get your name in lights and the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us produce more great audio. And for £3 a month, you'll get your name in lights, but you'll also get access to an exclusive bi-monthly podcast from the We Made This Talent Pool on podcasting, pop culture, and, well, you tell us. We'll take your suggestions. For less than the price of a coffee per month, you can help keep We Made This going. Just head to patreon.com forward slash we made this, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash we made this and get the ball rolling. Now, back to your scheduled programming.